How's everybody doing this wonderful Sunday? First day of the week. And at this moment, we want to give God what's rightfully and justly due Him. And um, we do that with open hearts, open minds, receptive to receive what the Holy Spirit wants to pour into us, what he wants to download into our hearts. We yield ourselves to the will of the Father. Amen. Amen. Father, we just give you praise and glory in this house because you alone are worthy to receive worship, majesty, and praise. Dominion and power belongs to you. And no one is more deserving than you. And we realize, Father, that as we contend with the vicissitudes of life, you are still God and you're still in control. And that no matter what we're going through, you are yet worthy of praise. And we make the conscious decision now, Father, to give you what's justly due you. And we do so gladly. Oh, Father, we lift our hands as we lift our hearts to you. Even as we lift our voices, we say praise be unto your name forever. To God be the glory for the great things that he has done. Come on, put those hands together for the Lord. I said, come on, put, now listen, that, you clapping for me that way. But, but we want to clap for the king this morning. I said, we want to clap for the king. Lord, you are good, and your mercy endures. It endures forever. Hallelujah. Now, it may be a little bleak outside, but in our hearts, we should be warmed by the fire and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I need some worshipers to stand with me this morning. If you're not ashamed, and you know that God is good, and he's worthy to be praised, I need the real worshipers to stand to your feet. And let's give God praise. Amen. Come on, click the track. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together like this. Come on. Here we go. Oh. 
some of us, our worship isn't sincere. Because as, as, as soon as the music stops, we sit down. But when your worship is genuine and sincere, we don't need a band. We don't need drums. We don't need organs. We got our hands. We have our voices. We have our hearts. And when it's a heart matter, nothing else matters. Because the reality is, God created things for you, but he created you for himself. And God's heart's desire is that we embrace worship because understand, worship gets you into his presence. See, the enemy doesn't mind praise because anybody can praise it, but everybody can't worship. Because the position of worship, the posture of worship, is that you gotta bow down. You gotta submit. You've got to surrender. And so I wanna know who in this room this morning is willing to submit, to succumb, to take the inferior position in allowing him to take the superior position in your life Amen. and so father in this moment we embrace you we embrace your presence the 24 elders are around your throne and they worship both day and night I heard the angels saying if you would allow me to use my Holy Ghost imagination Hallelujah, hallelujah, who is like unto our God, who is worthy of both glory, honor, dominion, power, majesty, and might. He's worthy. How many know he's worthy this morning? I said, how many know he's worthy? I wrote a little song that simply says,
worthy. Lord, you're worthy of all our praise. Lord, we love you real sweet. Lord, we love you. Yes, we do. Lord, we love you. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy of all our praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We lift our voice. Hallelujah. And we shout and we sing. Hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy of all our praise. Let the music play. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless you. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. No matter what you're going through, God is still worthy of our praise. Soprano, help me sing. Lord, you're worthy. 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 Oh, my praise. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Yes, you are. Lord, you're worthy. Can I join in? Lord, you're worthy. Amen. God is worthy of all the praise. At this time, I'm going to ask you to come across the aisle. It's prayer time. Truly, God, he is worthy of all the praise. Somebody said if I had 10,000 tongues, I couldn't praise them enough. If I had 10,000 hands, I couldn't lift my hands enough to give him the praises that he is so worthy of. At this time, let's bow our heads in prayer. God, our Father, we come in the name of Jesus, God, to say thank you. God, we know that you are worthy to be praised. So, God, we come around our altar this morning, Father God, with our individual needs, our individual circumstances, our individual problems that we go through, God. We, you said in your word, Father God, that we can come bold to the throne of grace and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, God, we come, Father God, around our altar, Father God, bringing all of our situations and circumstances to you because 
We know, Father God, that you are able, Father God, to do exceedingly abundant above all we can ask or think. So, God, we ask, Father God, to just step in right now, no matter what it is, God. We know that if we give it to you, God, you're able, Father God, to work it out for us. While we're trying to figure it out, God, we know that you have already worked it out. So all we need to do, Father God, is put it in, 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 in your hands, God. We know that if we put it in your hand, God, we know your hands are the best hands. That, it became, that things can be put in. Oh, God, we ask you, Father God, that you would forgive us for our sins, God, because we know, Father God, that we cannot worship you. We cannot praise you, Father. We forget something in our hearts. God, we ask you to look in our hearts right now, God. We ask you to move out anything and everything that would hinder us from giving you praise and giving you the glory. Father God, we ask, Father God, you have your way in this church. God, we ask you to move as only you can by your Holy Spirit. We ask it in the name of Jesus. God, we pray, Father God, for those, Father God, that desire to be here this morning. Somebody got pain rocking through their bodies, and somebody may have pain rocking through their bodies around the altar right now. And God, we ask you just touch them in a special way. God, we ask you bless that one, Father God, that, that's at home, Father God, desiring to be here. That one that's in the common less of the home, that desire to be here. That one, Father God, that, Father God, that's even incarcerated this morning, Father God. We ask, Father God, you bless all, Father God, that they hear us by way of life scream. God, we, 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 we just, Father God, we just ask you to have your way in our life this morning. We know, Father God, you're able to do all things but fail. You, you said, Father God, that we believe you can do it. We ask God that you bless our pastor as he come out to bring forth your word. Let your word, Father God, come in down in a mighty way. Lord, give us a rhyme of word that we may hear from you, that we may understand, Father God, no matter what our circumstances, whatever our situation is, whatever we're going through, God, you're able to see us all the way through. Just like David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear no evil, for thou art with me, thou rod and thou staff that comfort me, thou prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. God, we just ask you to continue to bless this service, God. We ask you to continue to bless our pastor. Continue to bless our first lady, God. Continue to bless, God, just bless, Father God, just everyone that's sounding the sound of my voice. God, continue to bless this choir. Continue to anoint them as they sing, lift up in their name, Father God. We ask it in the name of Jesus. And then, God, as we come to the close of this prayer, God, we ask you to bless everyone that's going to stand behind this sacred desk. Use them to your glory on this morning. That, that every man, every boy, every woman, every girl might know, God, that you're still on the throne. You still sit high and you still look low. And you can meet every one of our needs. We ask it in the name of Jesus and for his sake we pray. And they all sit together, amen. Look at your neighbor, give your neighbor a hug and tell them God loves you and so do I.
Good morning. Say the word. I want to be born again. That should be the ultimate goal of everyone. Do we have any first-time visitors with us? If so, would you please stand? Do we have any first-time visitors? If so, would you please stand? Well, we would like to take this opportunity to welcome those who may be joining us for the first time by live streaming. So since everyone is at home, my message to you is just to know that wherever you go, that God is with you. Take the Lord with you wherever you go, and may he cover you with his goodness. And always know that God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Amen. I think we have one announcement coming from the couples ministry. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. This is going to be brief. I just want to again extend an invitation to everyone who is married, regardless of age. You've been, you've been married a long time, you know it all, we need your help. And if you are like me, you are in grade two, we ask you to come also. Please, this Friday, every second and fourth Friday, we are inviting you. I'll be like Paul, I'll beg you, please come. It is now a time that we set aside to allow everyone to give back what God has so graciously and freely given us. It is offering time. If you need an, an envelope, would you raise your hand, please? God freely gives, and we should have an open and a willing heart to give back, to give of our time, our treasures, and our talents. If you need an envelope, would you, stand, would you raise your hand, please? And would you go ahead and stand? We ask that our ushers and our officers would make their way down front. The same God that feeds the sparrow is the same God that feeds and watches over us. He watches over all of his creation. He does all things well. Father in heaven, we come before you today just to say thank you for a God that never comes short of his glory, of our God that never comes short of giving us just what we need in a time of need. We thank you, God, for everyone that had to give, and we ask that you would bless those who did not, and we ask, Father God, that these blessings that were given back, that you so freely given us, that it would be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom, and that everything that's done decent and in order and breast we ask that you would just bless every heart who freely, freely gave back. In the name of Jesus, and the church says, amen.
Anybody got joy in my soul? Joy. Yeah, I had joy. I tell you, I wasn't really feeling good this morning. I got up because I had joy in my soul.
Praise the Lord. I am so glad that in Christ, all of my guilt, all of that stuff that stained me has been wiped away and washed in the blood of Jesus. And therefore, when I stand before God, I stand as one who has never sinned because he won't see my sins. He'll see the blood of my Savior. Somebody ought to clap, the, clap your hands for God if that's the case in your life. Well, God is so good and we're so grateful as we come to worship him this morning in spirit and in truth. We thank God for all of you who are here, those who are live streaming. Thank God for any of our first time and returning visitors and all of our members. We welcome you in the house of the Lord one more time. And I don't know about you, but I really believe if I were not saved, if I were not a preacher, if I were just in the pews, by now I would have already made up my mind this is where I need to be. Amen. Come on, bless God this morning. Our choir and our music department, our ushers, our AV, those who are with our youth and our children this morning, we are so grateful and thankful as we continue our theme for the year, and that is uh, living by faith. That is to have faith in God in Christ, to be faithful to God in Christ, and learning how to live by faith through God in Christ. And uh, it's my desire for us to have the kind of congregation that the Bible speaks of. Anybody knows me, uh, knows that I attempt to stay as biblically uh, a student sound as I can, because the only thing that's going to last forever that's worth anything uh, is going to be the Word of God. The scripture says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall last forever. Now, you know, I've heard people say in the song, they said the only thing that will last is, the, is this in this world, it says the Christ. But there are going to be some things that we did wrong that's going to last if we're not saved. But if we're in Christ, all of that guilty stain will be wiped away and departed from the very presence of our eternal God. So I want to encourage you, if you're not saved, make sure you get saved. And if you've, if you've forsaken God, or should I say, if you've strayed away from the, from the house of worship, get back in. And life is short and uncertain, but eternity is long and for certain. And you want to make sure when you cross over that you're ready to meet him face to face. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for the privilege of being able to share this time together. We thank you, God, that you have brought us together once again. And we thank you, God, for the spirit of worship in this house. We thank you for our praise team, our choir. We thank you, God, for all of those who have been laboring to set the atmosphere for worship. To you, God, we give all the praise, honor, and the glory. Now God has come this time for the preaching and teaching of your word. God, you didn't call us to excite people, you called us to enlighten people and to equip them, God, for life. I confess, God, I can't do anything good without you, but with you, God, I believe I can do all things. Pour into us your spirit and speak to us and speak through us and cause your word to find fertile ground to grow in and to develop in. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and the glory. We ask it, God, in Jesus' name, our Lord and our Christ. The church says, amen. 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 If you would turn with me to Luke, the 14th chapter, and while you're doing that, I want to thank God for Minister Chan, who stood in on last week and shared the word. Amen. Give God some praise for him. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for your prayers, and I'm glad to be back. But uh, in Luke, the 14th chapter, Jesus has a massive crowd following behind him. It's been estimated as thousands of people. And one of the things that Jesus intends to share in this particular text is that he's not so much concerned about numbers as he is about genuine followers. And so he sets the stage here as we read. He says, now great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me 
cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it become seasoned? It is neither good for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out, and he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I want to talk to you today from the subject, calculating the cost of faithful discipleship. Calculating the cost of faithful discipleship. Just to give you a glimpse of the understanding of what it means to be a disciple, Matthew the 28th chapter verse 20, 19 and 20, which is a great mandate of the church. When Jesus shares with his disciples and all who come after them, and he says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And that is to say that Jesus had succinctly made it clear and conveyed these words so that we can understand that his desire is for the world to be saved. But he also understands that the whole world would not receive him, which is why he says in John, many received him, but for those who received him, they became the sons and daughters of God. But Jesus gives the mandate to the church not to build numbers. The numbers are fine, but what Jesus is concerned about is about building a church that looks like him. We're living in a day and age when each generation is getting farther away from true Christianity. In fact, it has gotten so far away already that many people in the world and many others who have a desire for Christianity has turned off God and Christ simply because of what they have seen through people who profess Christianity. I shared this morning a true story about a, a pastor who once preached his first sermon at the age of 15. He said he preached his first sermon at the age of 15. He got married a few years later, around 20-something, when he got called into the ministry, about 25. He said he pastored from the age of 25 to 48, and he was on a mission to win the world for Christ. He pastored in about three or four different churches, or five churches, and he said no matter where he pastored, he came to the realization that most people were not serious about serving God. He said it got so wearisome to him that he became so tired and fatigued and worn out that after several years of pastoring, pastoring he gave up. And he made the statement that while he quit pastoring, he was still a believer. And so he chose that time when he quit preaching, when he quit pastoring, to visit over 125 churches of every denomination. And he said he went from various churches in five different states and went to every denomination he could. And he concluded with these words after visiting more than 125 congregations in five different states, he came to the conclusion, nobody is serious. And his testimony was that he gave up on God, and he came to the conclusion that God was not worth serving if he didn't really matter. God forbid that we ever live in such a way that people's conclusion of God is that he's non-existent and unworthy of worship and serving because of what they've seen in us. 
And so I want us to understand one of the reasons there are so many people who have fallen away from the church and who have taken for granted what it means to be a Christian is because most people are like this crowd that was following Jesus who has never really calculated the cost to be a true disciple. We've been lied to over the years because we know that we're saved by grace through faith. And many people have lied to us because they've given us the impression that grace is something to be played with or to take for granted or even be abused. But God tells us and Jesus tells us that he is not looking for merely great numbers. He's looking for true disciples. If you look at the text, it says a great multitude's with with him. He's got this massive crowd of people, a thousand, two thousand or more people following him. And you've got a picture in your mind that as he is walking, he's just done several miracles, he's done several things, he's fed the hungry, and he's got all these people following him, and right in the midst of it, he understands everybody following him is not sincere, so he turns to the whole crowd, and in a loud voice, he amplifies his voice, and he says, if anybody wants to be my disciple, he says there's some stipulations that must be met. And he said, the first stipulation is that you got to love me more than your mother, more than your father, more than your sister, more than your brother, more than your wife, more than your husband, more than your children, and more than yourself. And so he reads here, and I read here, he says, if anyone, doesn't matter how old you are, what your ethnicity is, what your nationality is, what your social status is, he says, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters. He says, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciples. So I want to give you the definition of four words that are tied to this title, calculating the cost of faithful discipleship. The word calculate is defined as to determine mathematically. I encourage you to write these down so you can go home and study them later. The word cost is defined as the required payment or estimated price for something to be acquired or achieved. Can you all see that on the screen? You can't see it? All right, well, let's, let's do one at a time if we can get it up there and make it a little bit amplified if you don't mind. Because I want you all to get this because, uh, again, this is a teaching message and I want you to go home with something that you can go back and, and see for yourself. The word faithful is defined as loyal, constant, steadfast, and remaining true to facts and the original. And then finally, the word disciple comes from the Greek word Matthias, which means a pupil who learns and trains under someone for the purpose of following and imitating their teacher. So based on the definition of these words, what was Jesus saying or trying to convey concerning discipleship. If I can put it like this, I would say discipleship is that you and I must determine mathematically the required payment or estimated price that we are willing to pay in order to acquire and achieve a life of constant and steadfast loyalty to Christ for the purpose of becoming like Christ. Let me say it again. You and I must determine mathematically the required payment or estimated price that you and I are willing to pay in order to acquire and achieve of life of constant and steadfast loyalty to Christ for the purpose of becoming like Christ. That is to say that instead of just being enthusiastic about the song and emotional and just giving your life to the church, if you will, or coming forth, he says count the cost. He said, because there's a price to follow me. And what Jesus says here is that while we're saved by grace through faith, he says that you and I are not just saved by grace through faith because salvation is free, but discipleship costs you. You get saved freely, but to become a disciple of Christ, it costs you something. And one writer said that God is not merely interested in the quantity of members, but in the quality of disciples. And too often we focus on how many people we can fill the house with 
instead of focusing on how much we can fill the people in the house with. Because what God desires of us is not just great numbers to call us a big church, but God desires a people who will be sold out for him and who will come to the realization of what it really means even in 2019 and in the 21st century what it means to be a genuine Christian. And I can understand why so many people get turned off because I've heard so many people profess with their mouths that they're Christians and they go to this church and they, they do this, but you see their lifestyles. And our Christianity is not built on the foundation of what we say, it hinges on the foundation of what we show. Jesus turns to this massive crowd who is following him. Some suggest they were following him because they were interested in seeing him do miraculous things. Others were following him because they found out that he would feed them and he would provide for them. Others found, began to join because they wanted to see what was going to happen next. But I stopped out and tell you, it didn't change much because most people who follow him today, if you don't believe me, listen to the sermons, listen to the songs of today. And most people don't follow him because they're sold out for him or to him. They follow him for what he can do for them. The average song you hear today that's called gospel, that's called Christian, that's called inspiring, is centered around what God is getting ready to do. The average sermon you hear today you hear it multiple times. God is getting ready to do. God is getting ready to do. God is getting ready to do. Which we're feeding people with this mess, saying what God is getting ready to do. And I keep telling you what he did already is sufficient when he did it on Calvary. God ain't getting ready to do anything. He's done it all. And that's why the Bible said when he got through, he sat down. The work is finished. But we've got this gospel that's going forth today. And I'm not suggesting God doesn't uh, give us some good things in life, but, but he doesn't guarantee us these things. And being faithful to God does not guarantee we won't have issues. And so the question that you and I must ask ourselves, are we willing to count the cost? He says just like buying a house or buying or purchasing something, building something, find out if you're going to be able to finish well. He said, because I would prefer you not to get started than to not finish well. Because if you get started and don't go all the way and then backslide and get back into the old world and revert back to your way, you make me look bad in the world. So count the cost. Find out if you're going to go through with it or not. And he basically says in today's terms, I ain't going to be mad at, if, mad at you if you don't go. But this thing is too serious for me to be gambling with people who are not serious about serving me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Go to Romans the fifth chapter and sixth chapter. The Bible tells us that, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God is so serious about saving souls, he died himself. And what Jesus is saying in this text, that if I died for you, you got to die for me. And so the first prerequisite to discipleship, it demands loving Christ above our families, above our friends, and above ourselves. Right there in verses 25 through 26, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, and we know he's not telling us to hate in the sense of hating people. That would contradict his word because he tells us to love everybody. He said in essence, the word hate comes from a Greek word in this text that means that we've got to love everybody we're connected to or attached to less than we love him. He's saying in essence, he must have preeminence. He must be some superior to our mothers, to our fathers, to our sisters, to our brothers, to our spouses, to our children, and to ourselves. And that is to say, my brothers and sisters, that when I've got to make a decision that's going to cost me something, and it's going to cost my friendship, going to cost my family ties, I've got to be able to say God comes first. Let mama leave, but God comes first. Let daddy not speak to me, but God comes first. 
Let my wife depart from me, but let God come first. Let my children suffer and say I'm not a good father, but God comes first. And let me even deny myself to the point when people ask, why would you do it? My response ought to be because God comes first. Why do you keep serving him? Why do you keep giving your last when you know you don't know how you're going to make ears meet because he comes first? Why do you tithe when you barely got a dime in your name or a dime in a bank account and all you got is this God understands how he understands but he comes first? Why do you keep coming to the house of worship regardless of the weather, regardless of how much you've gone through in the past week? Many people know your trials, your troubles. Why do you keep showing up knowing you're hurting, knowing you're tired, knowing your back is in pain? Why do you go because he comes first? And I want to suggest this morning that just like you, we all get tired. And I shared that since I've had this injury from last year, Every morning it's a chore just to get up. Every morning I got to stand there for a minute or two and let my nerves do what they do. And before I can find myself complaining, I start saying, Lord, I thank you. Because when I had the accident, I was paralyzed. After that, I was in a wheelchair. Went from a wheelchair to a walker. People had to stand me up. Get on both sides of me. My children and others would come over and help me. Couldn't write my own name. Literally had my daughters and others filling out my bills because I couldn't hold a pencil. A grape had become too heavy for me to hold. Once, and just a few years ago, I was pressing 250, 50 times. And I had injured this injury the last year and I couldn't pick up a grape. Couldn't hold a plastic fork by myself. My wife had to feed me. And so when I found myself, the first thing I asked for, while the only thing was moving when I was in ICU, I asked my wife to get my phone, and I asked my sister who brought me a long cord so I could charge it, and I could reach it to the bed, and I turned on my Pandora every morning. And I played it throughout the day, and I worshiped God. And the question comes, how can you worship him when he allowed you to have this accident? How could you worship him when you know you've been trying to live right, you've been trying to do it the right way? What are people gonna say? They're gonna ask the question, where is your God? But I'll stop by and tell you, he's still first. Yeah. And I declare I would rather die in his name than, die, than live without him. And people looked at me and I felt out of place, I felt awkward, I felt funny about myself, because I've always been a strong man, if you will. And here I am, been broken completely down. And people looking at me with sympathy, looking over me, trying to show that they're not looking at me like that. And I would lay there and look at them and look in their eyes. But I would say to myself, God, if this is gonna bring you glory, then bring glory to yourself. Because it doesn't matter what we go through, it doesn't matter what we want, doesn't matter what we desire. And for those of you who don't know the story, I shared it with you. I was on my way to a conference and I got to Atlanta, Mary and Jordan. I did what I always do. I went to the hotel, I checked in, and when I check in, I always build an altar in the hotel. I wasn't there playing games. And I prayed right there in the hotel at the altar that I built in that hotel room. And I walked out of that room, got in my car, went to the, across the street, and before I could get five minutes away, somebody hit me. And I went from being physically fit and strong and able to walk and couldn't move a toe. And that's why I say we don't live day by day, we live moment by moment. But right there in that car, with nothing able to move from my neck down, I could still talk to God. And I'll stop by to tell you, I've learned that just a little talk with Jesus goes a long way. And I talked to him in that car and I said to myself, in the name of Jesus, I will walk again. In the name of Jesus, I will rise from this. In the name of Jesus, I will. But I said to him, I said, God, I don't know why you allow this, but if it's going to bring you glory, so be it. And then I said these words, and I'm not saying it to boast, but I said it. I, I said, God, I'm glad you chose me for it and not somebody else. Because I don't know what he's going to do with it. I just want him to get some praise and some honor out of my life. And God is looking for some disciples. 
who are not concerned about themselves. Loving God, he says, you gotta love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Luke 10 and 27, he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. That is to say, you don't succumb to the dictates of the world just to satisfy your flesh. Things have gone wrong, and I didn't plan to go this route, but even when my wife and I, we've gone through situations and, and other women would present themselves to me, ain't no woman fine enough to give myself away from God. We've got to come to the point where discipleship is not just being a, a Sunday morning Christian, but learning how to deny ourselves for the glory of God, even when your, your flesh desires it. He says you got to love God more than your mother. And notice what he says. He says, if you don't choose this, if you don't choose to love me more than your mother, your father, your sisters, your brother, your wife, your children, and yourself, he says you cannot be. He didn't say you fell from grace. He didn't say that he was getting rid of you. He says you can never be mine if you don't give it all up. And that's why one of my favorite scriptures in Matthew 7, 21 says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we do many wonderful works in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? And he's gonna say, depart from me, I never knew you. You were never my disciple, you never lived for me. You never made a sacrifice, you never suffered in my name's sake. And that's why I'm one of those preachers that why I do preach encouraging words. I don't want to just preach an encouraging word to the point to where I never tell you, you got to get it right. That we can't afford to go through life being blinded by the fact that we think that life is full of just getting what we want. Because what happens when you think about the word disciple, notice what Jesus said. Jesus says in Matthew 28 and 19, he says, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And then he says this word teaching. And the word teaching in that text comes from a Greek word that means to inform, instruct, and to help mold somebody to change their will into God's will. Teaching means changing the will of people. Because in our world, humanity, in our lives, we are first. He says, teach them to make themselves last and make me first. That's what discipleship is. And Paul talks about a gospel that's going to be in the last days where people will just preach grace and never include with grace. There's a cost that comes to being a disciple. As I said, salvation is free, but discipleship costs you everything. So he says here, we got to love God above ourselves. Look at Philippians, the third chapter. I want to walk through these because, again, I think it's imperative that we uh, look at these scriptures. Because I'm a firm believer that what God has done through others, he expects to do it through us. Paul writes these words. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Then he goes on to talk about his past. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. He says, I was circumcised. You gotta understand he's talking to Jewish people. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Somebody gonna boast, he says, I was of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He said, concerning the law, I was a Pharisee, which was the strictest law and the strictest people of that day. He said, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he said, I was completely blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I count also all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered. It's a word we don't like to hear today. He says, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, but not only have I lost all things, he says, I count them as rubbish. Let me break it down. Paul was saying I lost my job, but it didn't bother me. Paul said I lost my family, but it didn't bother me. The folk in the church kicked me out, but that didn't bother me. I counted it as rubbish. Because of all that I lost, I gained Christ. And that's what he's saying. When you, when you compare Christ to anything, then after you do your math, you ought to end up with Christ. Nobody ought to come before Christ. 
Nobody. And one of the things that Jesus says, in fact, I, I think it's in a, a scripture I'm going to take you too late, but he says, he says that he talks about he didn't come to give peace in the world. He said, I didn't come to bring you peace but a sword. To divide families, to see who really loves me. To see who really puts me above everybody else. And so, discipleship demands loving Christ above our families and self. Going back to Luke, he says he cannot be my disciple. And so I want you to know that it's imperative that we love Christ more than we love ourselves and more than we love our family. But the second thing he suggests is discipleship demands not only loving Christ above our families and self, but discipleship demands carrying our cross daily. Somebody said it like this. We're saved at the cross, but once you get saved, you gotta carry a cross. It was the cross of Christ that saved us, but it's carrying our own cross that gives evidence of our true relationship to him. In fact, my brothers and sisters, when you think about the cross, one of the things in Rome, when they were to crucify somebody like they did our Lord, they would make that person carry the cross through public. It was designed to put them to shame, but it was also designed to show their submissiveness to Roman authority. And what Jesus is saying, my brothers and sisters, that if we're gonna be true disciples, we've gotta to submit to his authority even when we don't like it. In fact, he says in Luke 6 and 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? Why do you keep telling people I'm your Lord and every time you have to make a decision between you and your, and your feelings and your, and your thoughts and your wants and your desires and me, you always choose the lesser. Matthew 6, 18, 24, I want to walk through this. Matthew 16, 24 through 25, right after Peter had made that great declaration that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And Jesus says these words, because after he made that declaration that Jesus was the Son of God, he began to tell them how he must have to suffer and how he had to go to the cross. And the Bible says Peter grabbed him and said, not you, Lord. And Jesus responded to Peter right after he made that powerful confession. He said, Peter, get behind me, for you are of the devil. He said, in essence, any time you choose, even Christ, to choose my life over the heavenly Father, he says, that's not from God. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says one of the ways we get to prove our love for him is not simply by what we say, but by what we do. You prove your relationship to him, just like in marriage, by your loyalty and your faithfulness, regardless of what you go through. And anybody that's been married for a length of time knows that you go through all kinds of things. And it doesn't necessarily stop because you've been together a long time. You just go from one phase to the next. But your faithfulness to that person, your willingness to endure all things, your willingness not only to put up with them, but to help them to get to the point where they need to be gives you or shows you their love for them. And that's what Jesus said. He said, I'm going to take you through a lot. And I'm going to allow you to go through a whole lot. But you got to prove it by what you go through. He says, then Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, for whoever desires to be with me, you must forsake yourself. One of the poems that I've shared on numerous occasions, I do it about every two or three years, but I've never found a poem comparable to it that, that speaks such truth concerning this subject of the cross. It's a poem entitled Loss, and uh, the writer is anonymous. And I want to read this to you. Quoting, if all the riches of this world were mine and all the lovely gems that brightly shine, if I possess the largest state and grand and choicest fruitful fields and timberland, 
what would it profit me if death should call and I should be compelled to leave it all? If I could somehow win this world's applause and rise to lofty heights in some great cause, if I could have my fondest hopes fulfilled and with the prestige one be greatly thrilled, what would it profit if I reached my goal and then should die in sin and lose my soul? If I could boast myself of noble birth and consort with the greatest ones on earth, if I could make some friends in every land and find in every place an outstretched hand, how dreadful in the end would be my lot if Christ should declare, I know you not. What does it profit a man? to gain the whole world and to lose his own soul. And too many of us, as one pastor said, will find ourselves on the other side saying, Lord, I saved money, but I lost my soul. I took care of the house you gave me. I washed that car day and night, but I lost my soul. How dreadful in the end would be our lot if Christ should declare, I know you not. My desire, my brothers and sisters, as your pastor, as your brother, as your friend, as your servant, is that when we cross over from this side, we might hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Come on up, I'll make you ruler over much. And what I like about that word from Jesus, he didn't say we were faithful over everything, but he suggests we try. Sometimes we failed, but we got up. We were knocked down, but we got up. We messed up, but we got up. I stopped by this morning, I asked anybody, have you been one of those that fell down but you got up you messed up but you got up you were knocked down but you got up you're still trying you're still pushing you're still pressing Paul says in Philippians the third chapter I've not arrived yet I'm not yet apprehended but I'm pressing on toward the high calling of God which is in Christ Jesus my Lord I'm forcing and I'm pushing myself every day Yes, life happens, but let it happen. Because I'm connected to him who is life. Trials come, but let them come. Because he who is with me, and if God be for me, who can be against me? People may ostracize me, call me everything but a child of God. But as long as he calls me his child, I can wake up in the morning and smile. Just knowing if God is my father, I can kneel down on my knees and cry out and say, our Father, who art in heaven. I couldn't say that always, because it used to be a time when the devil was my daddy. But now I can kneel down at an altar, even anywhere in public, and also in private and say, our Father. I can say, our Father, because he's not mine by myself. Because there's some mothers that's been born again. There's some mothers that's been saved. There's some mothers that's been washed again. And all of us have been children, our children of the Lord. And so when I pray, I say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven. How is it going to be done on earth? Through us. The world sees Christ through us. And so discipleship demands carrying our cross daily for Christ. I want to show you Paul's resume in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter, verses 22 through 31, and I'm going to be ready to close. But Paul tells us what it means to be a disciple. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Now Paul is responding to the church at Corinth because there were false teachers who were boasting about who they were, but they were trying to condemn Paul. But Paul says, here's what really distinguishes me from them. It's not the fact that we're all Israelites, we're all Hebrews, that we're all the seed of Abraham. He says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak as a fool. In other words, I'm going to boast, although I don't want to. But since you all like listening to boasting, let me give you my resume. He says, I am more a minister of Christ. He says, I'm more in labors, more abundant in stripes. Then if he talks about stripes, you got to understand he's talking about being whipped for Christ. He says, in stripes above measure, I've been in prison more frequently for Christ's sake. He says, in deaths, 
often from the Jews, his own people, he says, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. What does that mean? He says five times during his Christian walk with God that he was taken and beaten five different times with 39 lashes. He says three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in pearls, are dangers of water. In pearls of what robbers. In pearls of my own countrymen. In pearls of the gentiles in pearls of the city, in pearls of the wilderness, in pearls of the sea, in dangers among false brothers, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often in hunger, in thirst, in fasting, in cold, watch this, and nakedness. Besides the other things will come up on me daily. My deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I'm not weak, who is made a stumble and I do not burn with indignation. If I must boast, I will boast in these things. Paul said, this is my resume. Here's how I know I'm saved. Here's how I know I'm a disciple. I'm not just a Sunday morning fair weather Christian. I've got a list of things. And I want to suggest, as I've shared in a sermon before, every Christian ought to have a testimony. You ought to have a testimony not only of your past and of your present and of your future, but included in your testimony ought to not be just what the Lord has done for you but you ought to have a testimony of what you've done for the Lord. You ought to have a testimony of the times you were forced to cry in the midnight hour because you stood for the Lord. You ought to have a testimony of the times you may have been lost your job because you were unwilling to follow, an uh, uh, to follow a corrupt system. You ought to have a testimony as a Christian that I've given up some things and this is my resume. God has been good to me, but I've also been good to God because I've forsaken all for his name's sake. Discipleship demands our cross carrying for Christ. And finally, discipleship demands remaining loyal and faithful unto death. In Revelation, the second chapter, verse 10, Jesus makes this statement. He says that we are to remain faithful even unto death. That is to say, as we give our lives to Christ, and believe me, he wants all of us to be saved. Faithfulness does not mean you don't come short of his glory. Faithfulness does not suggest you don't ever make mistakes. Faithfulness doesn't mean you don't get knocked down and doesn't even back out for a while. Faithfulness means I don't give up. I refuse. To quit. And so he says, in essence, until you breathe your last breath, you ought to be faithful. In Luke 22 and 42, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was wrestling with his flesh like all of us do. And he began to contemplate and consider what he had to go through. Here is God who created man, ready to be crucified by the men he created. He still has power to defend himself. He still has power to stop the process. But because his desire was to please the Father and not himself, he readily gives up himself. And he says, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. Whenever you see the cup in the New Testament, when it speaks of that, it talks about the bitter cup, a cup of suffering, a cup of shame, and a cup of sacrifice. So we understand that he knows that we get weak sometimes because it says in Hebrews that he understands where we've been. In fact, he's been there. And so therefore, he understands the infirmities of the weak. So we have a high priest that understands the struggles we have. But he's just saying, in essence, don't give up. If you're going to be my disciple, you can't quit every time you get hurt. If you're going to be my disciple, you can't start whining and crying every time you go through something as if I didn't know you were going to go through it. Because before you got through it, I'd already equipped you for it. You may not feel like you're equipped, but if I allowed it, you already equipped for it. Because I'm the kind of God that's a faithful God, and no matter what kind of temptation or test come up on you, I won't allow you to go through anything that I've not prepared you for. And so quit looking at something as if it's bigger than you, and look at the God that's bigger than everything, and know that if I placed you there, you're able. James says it like this as I close in James, the first chapter. He said, count it all joy. Not if, but when you fall into divers temptations. Not just a few, but many. 
He said, but knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. He says something that says in essence, don't run and turn away. He says, but let patience have her perfect work, that you might be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And when you get to that point when you don't understand what's going on, he says, ask of God, who gives to all men liberally, but ask in faith. He says, because the person who asks without faith is like the sea tossed and driven by the wind. He said, don't even expect to receive anything from God. So all James is saying, my brothers and sisters, is that all of us are gonna go through something. All of us are gonna have some trying times. All of us are gonna experience some difficult days. But don't you think you're by yourself because of what you're going through. But even when everybody else abandons you, God will never leave you, nor forsake you. And so you gotta learn to look to the hills from which cometh your help. And you gotta know deep down inside of you, when everybody else is turned away from you, all of my help comes from the Lord. You gotta know when the storms are raging, that God becomes a hiding place that you can hide under the wings and the shelter of his wings. And he'll take good care of you. I wish I had two or three folk in the house that knew what I was talking about. Won't he provide for you? Won't he protect you? Won't he care for you? Won't he keep you? Doesn't matter how dark it gets. Our God is able and he will see you through. And so my testimony is not as in depth as the Apostle Paul, but I can say this, I've been through some storms. I've been through some rains. I've had my share of heartaches and pains, but I'm still pressing home. I've had people come into my life and I've had people walk out of my life, but I'm still pressing on. I've had people meet me and call me Reverend, and by the time they left me, they called me everything but a child of God. But I'm still pressing on. I've been in a situation where I didn't have a dime in my pocket and literally only a dollar in the bank. But I'm still pressing on. I've learned how to have much and I've learned how to have little. Because what I have doesn't determine my relationship to him. I've learned to be faithful. I've been knocked down sometimes. So many times I couldn't get up on my own, but I would pray there in a prostate position and I would cry out on the name of the Lord. And I say, Lord, help me. Just get me up one more time. And before the devil could get to the count of 10, I was back on my feet. I may have been wobbling, but I was standing again. I may have been drunken, but I was standing again. I may have been stumbling, but I was standing again. I declare I'm not going to give up until I go up. Is there anybody in the house that has that testimony? I may go through something, but I ain't giving up till I go up. I'm not just a member. I'm a disciple. I'm not just a fair weather Christian. I'm a disciple. And so I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I want to suggest no matter what you go through this week or in life, you go to God first. Because if God permitted it, he's already prepared you for it. And so quit whining and start trying. Quit talking about how busy the devil is and start talking about how big your God is. Quit talking about how bad it is and talking about what God is getting ready to do or what he's already done through Christ Jesus our Lord. He is our strength. He is our ability to get to the next level. The writer said it like this in Psalm, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in the time of trouble. That's Psalm 46 and 1. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength. You gotta understand those scriptures are not designed to be cute. You only need strength when you're weak. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Why does he need to be the strength of my life? And then come back and say, whom shall I be afraid? Because I was fearful until he became my strength. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why? Because there are times in life when I can't provide for myself. But I learned God will provide. Don't give up, saints. 
don't gamble with your God's grace, make a decision to be faithful unto him until you die. That ought to be the decision every one of us make. Until I breathe my last breath, I'm gonna keep on trying. And I'm gonna keep living. And I'll give up anything and anybody for the glory of our God and for the name of our Christ. Let us stand in the presence of the Lord. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your word today. I thank you, God, that you're not looking for just great numbers, you're looking for faithful disciples. You're not looking at the quantity, but the quality of membership. You're looking for men and women who will not sell themselves short for temporary pleasure and gain, but will be faithful even unto death. God, we need you. We can't do it without you. And the enemy is on a rampage trying to prove us differently, trying to make us feel as if our testimonies were not genuine. But be thou our strength. Be our power. Be our hope, O oh God. So that each day when we awaken and every night before we lie down, we awaken and lie down with you in your strength, in your power, for your praise, for your glory, and for your honor. We ask it, God, in Jesus' name. The church says amen. As the choir leads us in a song of invitation, there might be someone here today who wants to receive Christ. Become that disciple. The good thing about discipleship is that you don't, you don't come as a disciple. You come as a sinner. You come as a person that needs to be discipled. And throughout life, God trains you and teaches you and prepares you and equips you until that day when he says, well done. So don't look at your life and think I'm not ready because you're not supposed to be ready. You're only supposed to be ready to come. You're only supposed to be ready to submit yourself to his lordship, to his training, to his teaching. And you let him teach you and train you in his own time. So if you've never been saved, never given your life to Christ, and you would like to do so today, I want to encourage you to come. If you've been like me before and you were faithful in the church and then you backslid and got out, but God is saying, come back home. This is the day to return. You're not promised tomorrow. If that's you today, why don't you come? Or maybe you're here today, you're saved and you might be well with your soul, but you're disconnected from the body. And you don't have a church to call your family. If that's you today, why don't you come? There's so much work to be done. God has a purpose and a plan for your life that's bigger than you, bigger than your will, bigger than your desire. Or maybe you need somebody to pray with you, pray for you. If that's you today, won't you come? Don't wait for somebody else. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Trust God. Make yourself available. If you make yourself available to him, he will avail himself unto you. you let him use you this morning, this afternoon. He wants you to be that light so somebody in darkness can see the way. He wants you to be that person that helps somebody else to see that they need him. They can't live without him. But you got to make yourself available. We trust and pray that everyone in here is saved and it's well with your soul. If not, please see one of these men or women or myself after service. They'll usher you into the back. They'll get some information from you and inform you as to what you need to do to uh, make a decision in whatever category you desire to make that decision in. Also, for those who are live streaming, we also encourage you that you can call our church family at 502-267-6121. Somebody will tell you the answer or return the call and help you get connected in whatever area you need to get connected in. But I say it all the time, don't gamble with your soul. Life is short. Life is uncertain. And while life is short, eternity will last forever. Make sure you're right when you cross over. At this time, we're going to prepare to take up not only our, not our offering, but prepare for communion. 
And so if you're saved, if you're part of the body of Christ worldwide, regardless of what denomination, if you've been saved, there's only one church. And so uh, we encourage you to partake with us and share this time with us. Jesus says that as often as we do this, to do it in remembrance of him. In the first Corinthians 11 chapter, Paul talks about the importance of doing this and making sure we're right with him and right with each other before we do this. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for this opportunity to share this time together. And in keeping with your word, God, as we attempt to do this on a monthly basis, uh, as often as you put it on our hearts. We pray, God, you bless and sanctify the bread that symbolizes your body. We pray that bl blessings upon the juice that symbolizes your blood, and then bless us, your people, as we are your body, and as we come together as one united body. Forgive us of our sins and receive our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ.
it'll never lose its power. God, we pray your blessings upon this bread that symbolizes the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we with thanksgiving unto you. We ask your blessings upon this juice that symbolizes the blood that was shed for the remission of many. As we depart from this place, we pray we never depart from your presence. Keep us, God, in your perfect peace. Let our homes and our hearts and our heads be filled with you from day to day. And help us to leave here today in coverage, knowing, God, that regardless of where we were before we entered this house of worship, we've been made the better now. We've been equipped, we're prepared, we're ready to do what you've called us to do. And we know, God, that if we should stumble and fall before next week, we serve a God that's not only able, but willing to forgive. We serve a God that's able to lift us up again and put us back on track. And so we pray, God, that we will not be deceived by the devil and allow ourselves to walk around with a cloud of guilt over our heads, but to know that we've been set free. We're no longer bound by our addictions, by our troubles, by our trials, and by the stuff of this world. But you've granted us your grace. And every day you awaken us, God, you've given us a new chance at life. And you remind us that you have a perfect plan for us. So as we depart from this place, may we never depart from your presence. Bless us, oh God, help us to come back on Wednesday at our noonday Bible studies and our evening Bible study. Keep us in your care, oh God. Bless every home, every heart, every head in Jesus' name. Unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior. Be glory, dominion, power, and majesty, both now and forever. Let the believing heart say, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful week. See you on Wednesday. Amen. What's up, Miss Jackie? How you doing?